Good morning, and welcome to the latest Design World Technology Webinar. I'm Larry Gannon, and I'd like to thank you all for attending this talk on integrated motion control. We'd like to thank our presenters and sponsors from Moog Animatics for being here today. Before we begin, let's go over a bit of housekeeping information on the ON24 system to start us off. On the console, you'll see a number of boxes that you can move and resize to suit your preference. If you need technical assistance, use the help widget at the bottom of your screen or use the Q&A widget to contact us directly. If you have questions for the presenter, please type them in the Q&A widget. We will answer questions after the presentation concludes. If you'll be tweeting about today's webinar, please join the conversation with our editors. There's a list of hashtags for you to use in your widgets. Now, please allow me to introduce your presenters today, Ben Burke and Hack Summer. A natural interest in how and why things work drew Ben, <coughs> excuse me, uh, excuse me, drew Ben to the sciences at a young age. In college, he found that engineering was a natural fit and began to pursue his degree in this field while seeking out opportunities to learn from people with professional engineering experience. After graduating with the Bachelor's of Mechatronic Engineering in 2019, Ben joined Moog Animatics as an applications engineer, where he continues to learn and improve his skills while applying what he already knows to motion control and automation. Hack has been with Moog Animatics for 21 years. His technical training includes U.S. Navy nuclear engineering, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. Hack has over 20 years in the automation and controls field, including advanced drive and motor design, machine design for semiconductor manufacturing, CNC machining and biomedical, along with experience in military conformance design and conformance testing. So thank you for being here with us, Hack and Ben. I'm now going to turn the microphone over to, to Ben, and he's going to get us started. Hey, thanks, Mary. Uh, first, first of all, I just want to say thanks again for, uh, for being here today, and we're excited to talk to you about some of our integrated motion control products and about why we call those sort of secret weapons for machine builders. So first, let's briefly touch on the agenda for today and what we want to cover. We'll start with a brief introduction about Moog Animatics, uh, the company as a whole, and talk about our smart motors, which are the, the heart of our business, and how we can expand smart motor systems with larger axes that go up to about 12 kilowatts in power. Then we'll cover combatronic technology, what that is and how it works and how it can help you, and then talk about some key markets and applications for our products. So we uh, have a few objectives that we've identified for what we want to cover and talk about today and convey, the first of which is how to simplify machines using integrated motion control systems like the smart motors, how to understand combatronic technology and how to use it in those motion control systems. And then third, uh, we want to talk about our DS2020 combatronic drive and tell you about how you can use that to expand your motion control systems with larger Moog CD series servo motors that go up to that 12 kilowatt power mark I mentioned, and how those can be integrated into existing smart motor systems. So if you're already familiar with smart motor technology and comfortable using that, you can add larger axes to your systems pretty easily with this DS2020 combatronic. So first off, let's start with a brief introduction to Moog Animatics as a company and talk a little bit about our history and the philosophy that drives the business here. So in 1987, Animatics was founded, and at this point it was just Animatics, no Moog involved yet. It was created by a couple mechanical engineers from San Jose who had worked with uh, traditional servo systems and didn't like how complicated they can get and how much uh, confusion there can be in specking out different devices that need to work together and connecting all those up and then uh, programming those to use traditional servo motors. And so they, they had this vision to be the first uh, motion control provider in the automation market to prov provide true and complete solutions instead of just motors or just controllers, just drives, things like that, which a lot of companies were uh, very focused on at the time. So they came up with this a uh, really advanced multi-axis controller uh, control system and integrated it with the drive and that uh, and then realized that they could also integrate a motor with that system to really invent and manufacture the first fully integrated servo motor in the world. And that uh, really allowed them and 
their customers in the future to make motion control systems, uh, you know, building and development very easy, um, very plug and play and very accessible. Whereas before it took a lot of specialized knowledge and a lot of different components put, to put together and a lot of time to create these systems with these fully integrated servo motors, it was much easier and much more accessible and uh, saved a lot of time. So in 2011, uh, Animatics was acquired by Moog, and that really expanded the Animatics business a lot because Moog added a lot of resources um, and opportunities in the market to Animatics, and Animatics you know, also added those integrated servo motors to the Moog portfolio, so together they're able to reach a lot of new markets and expand into a lot of new applications. And ever since then, the business has been growing pretty steadily, and we have worked on you know, a lot of different uh, applications in almost every field uh, and industry that that's out there by now. Um, everything from industry, industrial manufacturing to smaller one-off art projects and everything in between. So that philosophy of providing true and complete solutions to customers' needs uh, has drives the, still drives the business today. And that really uh, is our whole reason for existing, you know, and, and Mogi Animatics uh, together has a lot that we can bring to any application. Uh, we've got, you know, deep application knowledge with our applications engineers like Hack, who has been here for over 20 years um, and was using these smart motors even before he joined Mogi Animatics. So uh, he and our other applications engineers have a long way to see motion control products, um, and, and with related components like drives and uh, communications protocols. So they've, chances are they've seen uh, an application just like the one that you need to do, and we'll know exactly how to help you with that. Uh, because of that long experience that they have to bring, um, they will easily be able to map your needs to our product offering and find something that is the best fit for your machine, uh, something that really solves your entire problem, not just throwing a motor at it and calling it a day. We're really able to work with the customer and find a complete solution to uh, what that system needs to do. Not only that, but we, like I said, we don't want to just provide a motor and then step away. The uh, One of the driving principles behind our business model is to add value to the customer's application and their, their business as a whole and to really support the success of that customer so that we can both uh, succeed together. So we we like to offer uh, help with building those those machines and automation systems that the customer comes to us with, and really ensure that we add value from not only helping the customer design their machine from a motion control perspective, but supporting that uh, system throughout its development. And then once that machine is in the field, we also want to support the the people that are using that and anything that they need uh, in those in their endeavors. In that, uh, to that end, we have a lot of flexible and very uh, responsive services. We've got offices all over the world with applications engineers and all of them. So even if you're doing something you know, on, on the other side of the earth in you know, Europe or Asia, we've got offices over there uh, so that you can find someone local to support you and someone who can be proactive and not just be there when something breaks, but someone you can work with from the beginning to uh, you know, address any potential problems that may come up before they become problems. All those other offices also have very experienced applications engineers and support staff who can deliver their own expertise in a timely manner with any of our products, uh, you know, not just the smart motors, but any of the related components that we sell to support those motors, and really, again, meet your entire comprehensive need to do whatever you need to do, whether that's design machine or support the existing machine. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the smart motors, let's take a quick look at, at one of those. You can see a cutaway version or cutaway image rather on the right side here, one of our NEMA 23 motors. You can get an idea of how it's all packaged and put together. And here's a quick list on the left of what all is in a smart motor. So I mentioned earlier that a smart motor is not just a motor, it's not just a controller. It has both of those things plus an amplifier uh, and a drive all integrated into one unit. 
It also has a feedback device. You can see a little encoder wheel on the, the back right side of that motor. It has onboard memory, um, places to connect I.O. devices directly to the motor, lots of options for different communications protocols. We try and cover all of the common industrial protocols, um, not just serial, but things like can open, uh, device net, pretty much everything that you, know, you would find in, in an industrial setting. It's also got, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of options for uh, add-ons to the motors like brakes, gearheads, related components like actuators, because again, we really want to provide everything that a customer might need so that they don't have to uh, spend a lot of extra time and effort going to several different places to help design their system. Uh, we really want to work with the customer to figure out what their complete and total need is for that system and then work with them to satisfy that need from start to finish. So the smart motor is the heart of that and the driving force behind all this. And as such, uh, it's gone through a lot of refinements over the years and we re uh, the result is this fully integrated unit that contains not just a motor, but a very advanced multi-axis controller that can be a system master all on its own and can automate entire systems for you just from a single motor. Uh, and that, all that is put into a nice compact unit that's really easy to install and use. It's just got two connectors you can see on the top, plug those in, connect power and communications, and away you go. You got a, a fully functional motion control system right there. So it saves a lot of time and effort, and uh, you can develop the software side of things in parallel with the mechanical side. So while you're building your machine, you can be developing the controls which saves a lot of time on development cycles and saves costs as well. Now, what if you need a large access in your system? Maybe you are using a smart motor network already, but you've got a large gantry, for, for example, that needs to, to move really heavy loads. And uh, you're not sure if a smart motor will work for that. Maybe you need something with uh, a much higher uh, power level than some of the smart motors you've seen before. Uh, for example, the current smart motor portfolio offerings um, go up to about 600 watts of continuous power, and they peak higher than that, but continuous is really uh, more important in most cases. And previously, uh, if you needed larger axes than that, you would have to go to a separate controller and motor system that was outside the smart motor uh, network. And maybe you were taking advantage of our Combatronic protocol, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, that makes it really easy to network uh, several smart motors together and command them all um, from any other motor. But if you needed a larger access in the, in the past, there wasn't an easy way to do that and stay within the smart motor family. So we asked ourselves, okay, how can we further simplify um, complex multi-axis solutions? You know, how can we make it really easy for customers who need a larger axis or a larger motor to drive a heavy axis like that? How can we make it really easy for them to continue to use smart motors that they may already be familiar with and continue to leverage the unique functionality that comes with those motors while still staying within the smart motor family? So we came up with this idea to create a drive that seamlessly integrates those larger axes into smart motor systems. And that is the DS2020 Combatronic Drive, which enables the addition of higher torque servos to existing smart motor systems. So when you need a large axis, uh, for example, up to 12 kilowatts, we've got uh, a different series of mode motors that you can use this DS2020 Combatronic Drive with in order to control those larger servos as though they were a regular smart motor. You can use uh, this drive on an existing smart motor network and use those other smart motors to control uh, this drive as well, the same way you would with any other smart motor that you may have used in the past. So in that way, we're able to leverage the advantages of the smart motor technology since it's as easy to control a motor attached to this drive as it is any other smart motor on that same network. And that, again, results in a more compact, simplified machine because you don't have to have a completely separate control system for a single axis that needs a higher power requirement where uh, in a system that you know, has all the other motors on a, a smart motor combatronic network. 
using this Combatronic DS2020 drive, you can network all of those together and control them all uh, the same way. So it's, it's much simpler this way and uh, much more seamless to integrate those larger axes. Again, some of the benefits of using that Combatronic drive are that they are easily controlled by any smart motor and in the same way as you would control any other smart motor. Our Combatronic technology is standard, which is a communications protocol that runs on CanOp in our device net. Uh, you get significant space savings during installation because even though you have this one single separate drive, the rest of your machine is still using our integrated smart motors so you don't have all the bulky cabinets that come with regular traditional servo systems to house things like drives and controllers and power supplies, and you don't have all the cabling that goes between those and the motors and any sensors or brakes. So you still get a huge space savings and an ease of installation on the physical uh, machine building side. And from the software side, you, again, can just program these the same way you would the smart motors that you're already using. So you don't have to have two different command programs. You don't have to use two different uh, software command sets. You just do the same thing for your entire system the same way you would as though you were just using our regular smart motors. Uh, there are just as many configurations and functionalities with this drive as there are with our smart motors themselves. It's capable of all the same high-level firmware functions that the smart motors are. So you're not losing any functionality by using this or, uh, in addition to the smart motors. And it can do uh, the same type of quick, precise movements um, and advanced functions that the smart motors can, as well as have, uh, having similar options for configuring the larger motors themselves, like holding brakes um, and you know, shaft options, whatever you might need to fit the needs of your system. Uh, the, the DS2020 Comatronic drive itself has a couple of cooling options. So if you're using these in uh, hotter environments, uh, maybe you need a large axis to move things in and out of a uh, furnace or uh, you know, something of that nature, you can get natural or fan cooling options to satisfy your needs there as well. So here's a brief diagram of how you would connect these to uh, this, this drive to a larger CB series milk motor, as well as to your smart motor network. As you can see, it's just a few connectors. Uh, again, on the smart motor, just power and communications, and same on the, uh, the larger servo motor, power communications and feedback, and you're off and running. Um, this, this allows you to really easily integrate these larger servos into your smart motor-based machines. So if you're familiar with using our smart motors already and you just really need one, a little more power on one axis um, than you can conveniently get from a smart motor model, it makes it really easy to add a larger servo to it and still stay with the, uh, the same style of development that you've used before. It allows the use of the same SMI software and anti-basic programming language that you would use to configure and program the smart motors. You configure and program this GS2020 drive the exact same way. So there's really not any practical difference from a uh, software development standpoint on this. It's just a slightly different connection scheme that is still as simple as it gets, just a couple connectors and you've got a larger system integrated into, or sorry, a larger servo integrated into your system. Now we're, we're pretty proud of this DS2020 Compatronic drive and also very proud that we won this idea award um, in the motors and drives category, which was presented by machine design and hydraulics and pneumatics, which is not just a, uh, you know, a fan chosen award, it's, it's voted on by engineers and design professionals who work with systems like this on a regular basis and, and really have a good idea of um, what is, is useful and innovative in that space. So we're pretty proud that we were able to uh, get, some, get this recognition for what we think is a very useful product here that really expands our, uh, our product uh, offerings and allows customers to easily uh, expand systems that maybe they previously wouldn't have been able to in the way that they wanted. 
Um, so this idea is meant to highlight new technological developments in the market, uh, and in this case, in motors and drives. And you know, we are just really proud that we can offer this to customers and uh, that it gets the recognition that you know, we think it deserves, um, and we're glad to see that shared. So we're excited to bring you guys this, this new DS2020 Combatronic. And now let's talk about a little bit about that Combatronic technology. What is that? How does it work? Well, Combatronic is a uh, proprietary uh, communications protocol that we've developed. It's, uh, it sits on top of either CanOpen or DeviceNet protocols working uh, using existing CAN standards. It's a fully functional, bidirectional communications protocol. You can use it uh, with, in conjunction with uh, external controllers. You can, oh, you have an audio problems? Okay. Uh, well, I hope you all can still hear me. Um, you can use, uh, you can use Comatronic with a, smart motor networks or with external controllers you don't have any don't have any data collision between those things so <clears throat> so smart motors can be talking through uh, combatronic between themselves and, and an external controller can still be sending commands uh, to those motors and to the ds2020 combatronic drive and there's no data collision there so you can have two communications protocols running at the same time to really streamline the operations of your system. And uh, it, this Combatronic doesn't work just through a few outgoing commands that are specific to Combatronic or just through IO handshaking or specific uh, values being assigned to specific registers. It's a fully functional communications protocol. Uh, any motor uh, or the DS2020 drive um, can read and write from any other motor, and it's it's really easy to use. So, the point of developing this protocol was so that uh, to to retain the ease of use of the smart motors, and uh, really again take advantage of their full, fully programmable nature and the ability of any of them to be a complete system master and control multiple smart motors and other devices on one network. So we wanted to make that as easy as possible both from a hardware and a software standpoint. And for customers who are using CanOpen or DeviceNet protocol, we were able to come up with this Combatronic protocol to make that even easier. Uh, as far as how you use it, how to implement it, the only things you need to do to set it up are match baud rates between the devices that you want to communicate with Combatronic uh, between and ensure that those devices have unique node addresses on the CAN network which again is you know, uh, something you would need to do for CAN communications already. So it's really no more work than setting up a CAN network uh, without using Combatronic protocol. So in a uh, traditional smart motor network, all the commands that you program into a smart motor or send to a certain smart motor are for that specific smart motor only. Uh, so if you set a speed uh, in a smart motor program, that speed will only be set in that one motor. Now, with Combatronic technology, those same commands can be applied to any other motor on the network, or they can reference any other motor on the network, as if all those motors were being controlled by a single multi-axis controller externally. But you don't need that extra external device in this case. And uh, you know that makes it very easy for, again, any motor to be a full system master and for you to program any of those motors to do that. It also allows, it, uh, allows you to easily distribute control throughout your system. So you can have one motor running a smaller group of motors within the greater system, and then another motor running a, a, a different group of motors in that same system, and have all of those motors con uh, communicating really seamlessly and, and easily between themselves to coordinate their motion and coordinate the throughput of the entire system. Combatronic protocol is not register or data packet based, like I was saying. It's not just uh, used through IO handshakes or setting specific values in certain registers. There's full access to all the motors on the net Combatronic network, and it's it's really simple to use because you just use the 
target node address appended on the end of each command with a colon using the same commands that you would normally program into each motor or that you would send from a terminal if you wanted to use an external device. So it's really, it's not a, uh, a great departure from the existing software command set. You use the same commands. You just give it an address after the command if you want that to go to a motor that is not uh, the motor local to that command. So there's a brief example here on this next slide. Without the Combatronic protocol, this first command uh, under the first bullet point, that blue G, would issue a go command in the one single motor that that G command is programmed into. But when you use Combatronic syntax, you can see a couple more examples down here. You can append the node address of the motor that you want to send that go command to. So a G colon two would tell motor two to go, and a G colon zero tells all motors to go. The zero is the global address, so any combatronic command appended with a zero uh, will be received and executed by all motors on that network. So as you can see, it's really easy to use. Uh, you use the same G command, there's no difference there, and the same goes with any other motor command in the, the anti-basic smart motor programming language. All you need to do is, uh, you know, add that node address to the end if you want that to go to uh, a motor not local to the, uh, the program that that command is in. So very simple to use, and again, simplicity and uh, seamless integration is, is really the whole driving force between our smart motors and this Combatronic protocol, and now our DS2020 Combatronic drive. So next, we're going to talk about some key markets and applications. And at this point, I will hand it over to Hack Summer, our applications manager, who can talk to you more about those in detail. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, my name is Hack Summer. I've been with the company, like I said, for a little over 20 years. My background also includes a lot of machine design and build, so I typically get involved in a lot of the applications. Uh, let's see what those applications are. Okay, uh, this is just a quick shot. You can see most of them are just point, you know, big points here. Simple point-to-point -point positioning, multi-axis coordinated motion, entertainment, vertical applications, sorting, diverting, and so on. So I'll talk a little bit briefly about those. Simple point-to-point, -point, you know, where we start, that's a case where someone may want to upgrade a system from pneumatics or hydraulics and go straight over to an electric cylinder, you know, drop a a smart motor onto to a uh, rod cylinder type actuator or, or a diverter actuator, but they just needed point to point and go there. Okay, uh, you notice down at the uh, uh, or excuse me up at the uh, upper right, you'll see that diverting and repositioning. Both of these are the same sort of thing. They're just saying, hey, I've got a simple application, but I want a little bit better control. In pneumatics or hydraulics, hydraulics can get messy. Pneumatics you can run on a main system. But you don't want to have, you know, one big 60-horsepower compressor drop down all machines. A lot of guys are going over to servos for replacement. So these point-to-points are sorting and diverting. You drop a servo in there. Not only do you gain the point-to-point -point where you just have, say, an input program to, say, extend out and retract back like an air cylinder did or a hydraulic cylinder, but you also have the ability to control axle, decel, and the speed, and you can even go to multi-positions. In hydraulics, you could do multi-positions. In pneumatic, it would have had to be air over oil, for example, to get there. With smart motors, you have the option to do either one right out of the uh, box because you can program it to as many positions as you want, hundreds, even thousands of separate positions. Okay? Multi-axis coordinated motion mentioned there. Uh, yes, the smart motors can do this. A lot of people would question, okay, you've got the uh, separate processor in each motor. Do you need a centralized uh, controller or PLC or PC to tell each motor where to go? No, in fact, you don't. Uh, we have something called the position target synchronized commands. Any one smart motor can be the master axis on this multi-axis system and control up to 120 plus other motors. Okay, uh, it's, it, it is in a linear interpolation type mode when you use the position target synchronized. They basically guarantee all motors to start and stop at the same time. Really good way to do it. Uh, you don't have to have a smart PLC or a PC to do that job for you. Uh, all the math is done within the motor. So you give simple X, Y, Z coordinates, for example. The smart motors will already know how to do that in the virtual path uh, for X, Y, and Z to get there at the proper amount of time. Entertainment industry, we mentioned that here. 
Uh, it's not a, 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 a typical application uh, that most people do in industrial automation. But when it comes to you, it does quite a good job because uh, typically it's large axis count. We've done anywhere from 30 or 40 axes up to literally 1,700 axes on one machine that these were in entertainment or marketing machines. Okay, so uh, don't don't be shy about those type of applications where you have literally hundreds of axes. There's ways to set up the networks to group them together to where any one smart motor can still control hundreds of other axes. Vertical applications, of course, that sounds pretty generic, and it's actually showing one of these things where we have these balls moving up and down uh, uh, for, for an entertainment application. But the reason we mention it is we have brake options in all the motors, but we also have something else that a lot uh, of other uh, products don't have. We have something called mode torque brake and trajectory overshoot braking. There are two means of, of getting a lot more stopping power out of an application. And in a vertical application, that, that comes in quite necessary. Uh, basically, you get a 66% increase over advertised torque and the ability to slow down or stop a heavy moment of inertia load. And in a vertical load application, that comes in quite handy. I already mentioned the sorting and diverting up there. So let's go down to tracking, pan, and tilt applications. Some of these are known as AS-L controls for azimuth elevation control for military and whatnot. A lot of the tracking and pan and tilt, the tracking aspect of it, may be tracking facial recognition on people in an airport, for example. We have a lot of those on handoffs on position controls from one motor set to another on pan and tilt controls and security issues, uh, you know, where they, where they have to literally track from one set of pan and tilt motors to the next set, and it passes off those positions on where to move and then keep tracking. Uh, additionally, if it were saying tracking sunlight for an AZEL control or pan tilt control for solar installations, where you wanted it to self-track the sun as it rises and falls, a lot of people call that an equatorial mount if you do it mechanically, fact of the matter is those sensors can go directly into the motors. The motors can sense the light difference and center AZEL control on the sunlight source as it pops across the sky from morning to evening. So you don't need an external controller to do that. We have mentioned something called bed of nails or rays. Uh, that's on the, in this particular case, you can see that's part of a jet. Um, what happens is when they're building the skin of the jet, the outer hull of the jet, they have to support that hull while they're water jet cutting or cutting through uh, the outside for whether it be ports for windows or pitot tubes for airflow detection or whatnot. This bed of nails actuators is a whole slew of um, rod, type, rod type actuators that the smart motors are connected to, and it controls the form of that. Additionally, you can go in there and control aspects of the um, – the, uh, uh, shape of the airfoil of a plane. We've even gone into these bed of nail actuators and done that within wind tunnels. So it just gives you an idea of some applications we've been into. Capping and fastening. It kind of goes in with uh, tightening down nuts, nut runners, bolt runners, even swedge lock type applications where you go to a given load, sustain it for a while. Uh, an application we're in uh, a lot is on, on uh, plastic bottles and even some non-plastic or, or less, uh, more resilient type materials that may not, not be just plastic. But basically what happens is you tighten down these bottle caps or nuts or bolts and other applications, but I'll, I'll focus on the bottle caps for a moment, until you reach a certain plastic deformation. You hold there for a certain amount of time and then release the stress off the tooling to guarantee that while that product is being shipped and goes through thermal cycles through a truck or different atmospheres before it finally gets to where it's going to reside in maybe a Walmart counter, uh, then it won't back off and leak later. The application is good for us because instead of the typical 10-bit PWM control you have on most servo drives out there, we actually have a 16-bit PWM control, which means we have a much higher resolvability in being able to have repeatable torque down specs on a machine. We have one application or it was actually a bolt and nut runner uh, years ago where they said, hey, we're getting about a 10% deviation from one part to the next as we tighten this down. They placed smart motors in there without even tweaking down tuning. There were less than 2% deviation. After that, that and, and getting the tuning in there and tweaking it in better over a few weeks, there were less than 1% deviation. 
So we're extremely tight controlled on any application where it's screwing down to a certain amount of torque, capping, uh, bolt uh, and nut running, and even swedge lock where you're pressing in, say, pop it valve into a steering unit uh, for, for power steering for a car. We want a good minute of those. CNC milling and contouring. Now, I mentioned multi-axis coordinated motion earlier. There's two means to do this. One is within the smart motors, where it's basically point to point. They all start and stop at the same time, which is more of a synchronized control. And then there's true CNC milling and contouring, where, in fact, you do have an external host. For those types of applications, we meet the uh, can open 402 interpolation protocol spec, also the same spec for Ethernet IP, um, uh, EtherCAT and Propinet to where you need an external control that does, you know, true contouring mode on multiple axes. You can do this either through 232, 485, CAN, or Ethernet. So we have multiple avenues to do that. Typically it's with open source software, you know, I say open source software other than ours, but we do in fact have a CNC software package that sta uh, takes in standard G code or, or FANUC series type G code files, even you know Haas power uh, Haas mill type files will, will go into our software. Last one I'll mention on here is welding. The reason we show this one is welding oftentimes is associated with electrical noise, and you have a welding robot. It usually has to have a hardened case externally for one thing, just because of welding splatter. But the bigger process there is that if it's a plasma arc or a uh, high-frequency welder, oftentimes the electrical noise off of that will induce an issue of feedback problems on a servo. Because our servos are fully integrated and the encoder feedback or the hall sense co encoder combination feedback is internal to the housing and the controller is also there, we're pretty much impervious to that noise. So we've had smart motors right next to the welding tip where we had to, say, rotate the welding tip or move it around the corner or something, or even on pipe runners inside of pipes underground where you do weld, fix, and inspect, the smart motors had no issues in that noise environment and, and operated quite well and had good repeatability. So that's why we mentioned that welding one there. Okay, a uh, couple of examples of some other things where we have a firmware capability beyond the typical hardware. Now, before I mention the hardware, 16-bit PWM control, for example, that's in the hardware of the drive. Now we have firmware features as well that focus on certain types of applications. We mentioned uh, here in this slide, traverse and take up winding. Okay, uh, you know, you can think of winding up a spool of, I don't know, uh, wire on a, on a spool or rope. I don't care. You know, it could even be guitar string winding. Okay, you wind the outer uh, wire around the core wire for bass string on a bass guitar and even violins. Okay, so uh, bottom line is it's all the same thing. You're, you're spinning a core material, whether it be a spool or a core wire, maybe for catheter or for biomedical as well, and then you're moving along that core material or spool at a given rate. Well, we have an issue where, uh, you know, fiber optics, for example, very fine and yet very, very uh, I guess you would say sensitive to the surface blemishes you might get on a fiber optic. Customer came to us and said, hey, I need to wind up the spool, but my problem is the fiber optic uh, cable falls down into the previous layer that was wound and it kinks up. And a as a, a result, uh, the kink in the surface causes a lower light transmission in this fiber optic. And he asked the question, can I do some sort of S-curve back and forth while winding? And I said, well, yeah, you can. We have electronic gearing, which allows you to gear across the spool by how fast the spool's running, but we also have electronic camming, okay? Camming is like a, a cam profile for a valve lifter in an engine, for example, but let's say this profile is electrically done in a servo. We can actually coincide electronic gearing and camming at the same time. So I placed an S profile cam table per rev of the spool within the motor's program, and then the gearing profile says, okay, for the width of the spool, I move across at this rate. So it's a combination of gearing and camming to give you a fiber optic wind that does not fall down into the groove of the previous layer that was wound. As a result, you have higher quality fiber optic winding machine. Okay? That's the reason we show that. 
it is something that's capable within firmware that you don't typically find in competitive products out there, and it comes in quite handy in places like this. We have a, a lot of other features within traverse and take-up winding, not within the time scope we have today, but the fact of the matter is you can adjust uh, left or right spool widths dynamically, gear ratios dynamically, and we even have something called encoder count offset. So if you're winding something like a ribbon or tape and it varies in width, you can actually change that by detecting the width and pack the edges right up on it so you have no hollow spots in the core of the wind. It's good features to have there. Okay, another one here. It's kind of like the traverse and take-up winding, but in this case, it's a case of supply or take-up reel. A lot of people will say, okay, you can do traverse and take-up winding, but can you control the tension? Well, yes, we can. Here's an application where actually it was one of the first ones I used years ago as a customer a long, long time ago. Okay, you have a set of nip rollers off to the right here, and those nip rollers are basically controlling the feed rate in whatever process this is. This could be, a, you know, a, a label-making machine, for instance. It's printing the labels on this material, and the material comes off the supply rail. Well, you have to print it at a certain rate, and it has to be consistent with that speed. The problem is the supply rail, as you take material off, the diameter decreases, and you need to change the feed rate. Well, the supply reel has to have the right tension to control wherever the process is of printing, for example, or coating an emollient coating on this film or whatever it might be. So you can place in, for example, in this drawing, a dancer arm. That dancer arm's position can do a feed override to the electronic gearing that is already set up. So at, at the first onset, you would see the green arrow is going from the right of the motor uh, over to the left of the uh, supply reel. Okay, that's electronic gearing. As one, as one motor moves the nip rollers, the supply reel reels out at the same rate. Well, what happens is to control the tension and control the velocity override, the dancer arm detects when the speed isn't quite right. Its angle moves up or down accordingly, and it overrides a velocity feed on top of gearing. So you have two trajectories working at the same time. It allows this thing to maintain a consistent drag to the nip rollers the entire time, regardless of the fact that the radius or diameter, I should say, of that spool decreases as it takes materials off. Good part is it runs both ways. You run it the other way, it's electronic gearing, so it could be both a supply and take up reel setup with the exact same program because the gearing runs bi-directionally and the velocity override runs bi-directionally. So it works for both ends of the process. It, it, on the take up side where you're doing supply and take up, it may be that the labels are now placed off of it and you remove the outer portion of that and the mess that's you know contained off of that, they have to reel up on another reel. So it work, works at both ends. Okay. Uh, we mentioned earlier, I should say Ben did, if you have a large gantry system and the smart motors, which, by the way, do run off of below 50 volts, which is below shock level voltage for a uh, machine, a lot oftentimes people will buy these motors because they're below OSHA shock level voltage. So you don't need the large cableways that are shielded uh, with 240-volt AC systems. You can run 48-volt systems unshielded. When I say unshielded, mechanically uh, you know, uh, against anything hitting those cables, okay? So uh, as a result, the cable cost goes down. But let's just say you have a larger system where the base axis has to be much larger than the smart motor. It runs off of 240 AC mains as opposed to 48 volts DC. In that case, that's where you would run that DS2020 drive that Ben mentioned. Since the PTS commands that I mentioned earlier allow multi-axis control point-to-point, -point, and they already calculate all the motion required for, a, say, multi-axis pick-and-place, for example, you don't need to think about the code to program that DS2020 drive because any one smart motor can be the masters of that. So the Z-axis, for example, in this system could run the X, the X prime, which may or may not be smart motors, or they may be DS2020 drives, and the Y-axis, it could run them seamlessly. The good part about it is you don't need to learn anything new. Even if you swap to that other product, which wasn't normally an animatics product, it'll now run it just as if it were another smart motor. And it can handle the heavier loads there. And since those two motors would be on the base, that X and X prime, the cableways going to those would be the higher voltage and the lower voltage cables to meet OSHA safety that are flex and more likely to possibly 
you know, cause damage to the cables over time, at least they're not a shock level issue because they're below that 50 volt shock level. Okay. Summary on this. The smart motors, uh, as has been mentioned, it, they're fully integrated smart motor. They're compact, easy to use. Integrated Combatronic uh, drive enables, uh, you know, uh, higher torques into the uh, DS2020 drives. Uh, this allows easy networking. What he may not have mentioned, uh, and, and, and we probably didn't say it in this slide, Combatronic resides in two places on smart motors either over CAN, which is control area network, hardware level, which could be device net or CAN open, or it resides on Ethernet. And when it uh, resides on Ethernet, it's over Ethernet IP. For instance, Alan Bradley, Ethernet IP. Uh, this allows motor-to-motor -motor communications, even in spite of a PLC talking on the exact same bus. For example, if you're on device net or CAN open, talking from, say, an Alan Bradley or a, or a Beckoff or, or something, and yet the smart motors still want to talk between each other over the same CAN bus. Comatronic allows that. It's on a different header portion of the data packet that those PLCs would ignore. They see that data packet coming through, and they go, oh, that's not for me. That must be for one of those other nodes out there. So the Comatronic technology allows seamless motor-to-motor -motor communications while the HMI, HMC, or PLC is talking in their own language to the smart motors as well. Okay, so like I said, that applies to both Ethernet and CAN networks. Good to know because it makes your job a lot easier. It's not as, as difficult to think about what has to be programmed. The smart motor syntax is a lot easier to program for multi-access than, say, ladder logic. Okay, then. So I think we're going down into our question and answer time, and I think I've got to turn it back over to one of the presenters there. Thank you, Hack. That was uh, very good. Thank you and Ben to, uh, for educating our audience on integrated motion control and your smart motor technologies there at Moog Animatics. Um, now is the time to enter your, your questions into the Q&A tab if you have any questions for Ben and Hack, so please do that now. In the meantime, we'll get started with some questions that we do have already. Um, let's start with, with you, Hack. Um, what makes the smart motors different or better than other integrated servos on the market today? Well, I could just say they're better because I like them more, but that would be quite biased. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is we, we truly do have the, the, the invention of the smart motor. But the invention was bore out of the idea of multi-axis control to begin with, so it wasn't just a motor with a drive. It was actually a controller with the drive added and then placed on a motor. So it's a little bit reversed. We call it a smart motor. But in fact, it's a smart control placed on a motor. So as a result, from the get-go, we were looking at the machine side of control, how to control the I.O., how to control the motion, and how to control more than just one axis. So comparatively speaking, the smart motors truly are a motion controller on a motor. Uh, like I said, it's calling it a smart motor, yes, it is, but it's, it's, it's truly a multi-axis system. Now, the other aspect of it that is a little bit different, we run a, an extremely compact drive design very efficiently, and as a result, we have the highest torque density on the market of all integrated motors out there. So you may see another integrated motor. Uh, it may be twice the size for the same torque. Some of them are three times the size. The other thing is we have a higher thermal limit. We have the highest thermal limit of any integrated product on the market right now, uh, so we can handle a wider range of applications that may be outdoors in the sun, for example. Okay? Great. We have a couple new questions popping in here, so we're going to jump into those right now. Um, what is the overall dimension of the smallest smart motor? The smallest smart motor would be a NEMA 17 smart motor. If you recall, the NEMA 17, uh, excuse me, the NEMA standards, 17, 23, and 34 mean 1.7 inch square flange, 2.3 inch square for the 23 and 3.4 inch square. So yes, the smallest one we presently have is a NEMA 17. Now I will say that's the bolt face. It's a little bit long because we have to fit the drive electronics on it and one side's a little bit thicker outside of the 1.7 inch. But if you go onto the website, you can get the CAD drawings there and see if it fits in your application. We have SolidWorks, AutoCAD, and PDF drawings available. Great. 
there is something uh, pretty specific. Um, I'm, I'm assuming about a model. Um, can multiple DS2020 be in a system? Maybe three to four of those DS2020 using combatronics. Uh, yes. Now, we'll say the combatronic is a syntax system that comes from a smart motor. The DS2020 isn't programmable per se. It's basically a slave node to a smart motor. But like the smart motor, it can take combatronic over can open, for example, or it can take standard can open 402 uh, motion profile. So, yes, you can put multiple ones on there. If there's at least one smart motor in the system, that one smart motor can control all the DS2020s using the smart motor syntax. If you don't choose to have the smart motor as part of it, yes, you can use the DS2020s and use standard can open protocol. Great. We've got another one. People are really uh, throwing these questions out here, so that's great. How does uh, the smart motor usually communicate with the overall PLC? Okay, uh, it depends on the system. The smart motors, all smart motors since day one either had RS-232 or 485 or both. Okay, RS-232, standard ASCII. Okay, 485, standard ASCII as well, which includes Modbus. So Modbus RTU over 485. There's no extra charge for that. All smart motors out there can handle 485 Modbus. Most of them have RS-232. The additional means that you can communicate from a PLC would be CanOpen, DeviceNet, Profibus. Those are all two-wire bus structures. Or additionally, mm -hmm. EtherCAT, Profinet, or Ethernet IP. So it really depends on the PLC, what brand you have. And some PLCs, they, they don't even use the, the serial protocols. They may use just I.O. handshaking. So you do have that option. All smart motors have at a minimum of seven I.O. and up to 17 I.O., depending on the model with the options you get. So if a PLC programmer, for example, is not familiar with working through one of the standard open buses, they can actually just do I.O. handshaking, which does happen quite often. So it really depends on what method you want to choose. But those are the ones that are available. Great. Hopefully those answered your questions there. Um, here's one uh, that came in a little bit earlier. Um, how customizable are the smart motors, and can Animatics customize them for any application? Uh, when you say customized, uh, I would say customized in the manner of software, firmware, or hardware. Hardware level, the customizations include possibly flats on the shafts or a keyway, you know, typical things like that, or a break option or a specific bus option that I mentioned earlier, okay? You may want can mm -hmm. open, you may want device net, you may want Ethernet options. Uh, newer ones we're going to be releasing this coming year will also be multi-turn absolute encoder options. So, so these are the type of hardware level options. Uh, outside of that, customizable, we have done some that are sealed, unsealed, some that had special seal encoding, and we've even done some that are brand labeled specific to cover our label, okay? So it's inside a machine, but the customer doesn't even want to know it's a smart motor, but they want it special painted. We have done things like that. So it, with regards to the question, it depends on the context of what they mean by customizable. Absolutely. And that's where you guys come and play when they can follow up with you afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I think we probably have time for about maybe one more. So uh, if anyone has any more questions, please get them in now because we're almost uh, at the end. Um, here's one that I, I thought was kind of interesting. Um, can smart motors be used in a system that has traditional dumb, in quote marks, servos? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and in fact, what may not have been mentioned was that the smart motor is also a can open master. So if you have a can open okay. drive out there or any can open nodes for that matter, I don't care whether it's a drive, a load cell, a, a temperature sensor, an I.O. block, I don't care what it is. If it meets the can open 301 spec uh, or 402 spec for motion, the smart motors can control that as well. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be an animatic smart motor. For instance, it could be anybody else's brand drive other than the DS2020 drive. So that DS2020 drive was no different than anybody else's CAN bus or Ethernet drive. The difference is we added the ability to directly take smart motor syntax. So what happens is if you use somebody else's drive, you're back to using the standard CAN open type register-based mapping and set up PDOs and SDOs within the smart motor to control it. But if you choose to use the DS2020, you can just directly use syntax you would use local to the smart motor. So it's a case of how easy do you want to use it or how seamless do you want it with an existing system where you need to control it from a smart motor instead.
So you have those options. Wonderful. Well, that looks like that's all the questions we have in, in the Q&A box for now. So again, um, I'm going to put the contact slides up here. If you do have questions, um, you are welcome to uh, you know, share those with Ben and Hack directly. So thank you to everyone for attending this webinar from Design World. And thanks again, Ben and Hack and Moog Animatics for helping to bring this great information to our audience. We really appreciate you guys being here today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder that this, e this presentation will be emailed to our audience uh, later today and will also be available at designworldonline.com archived so that you can share it or watch it again. Thank you for attending and have a great day.